Welcome to another edition. No, it's not just another edition. It's four ninety nine of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's April the eighth, two thousand and nineteen. Okay, welcome to episode four hundred and ninety nine of Anglican Unscripted. We want to thank you guys for being part of the show because you guys love to to log on and watch us and then share us and then comment on the YouTube channel and then like us on Facebook and uh, retweet us and do all you can to help to get this program out. We really do appreciate that. And we, we've noticed a lot. Uh, we're get, almost getting 3,000 viewers per episode, and that's that's quite a, a bridge to gap for such a uh, unique show where we just talk about all things Anglican and unique Anglican news, and uh, it's kind of the inside baseball of Anglicanism, or I'm sorry, inside cricket of uh, Anglicanism. And so, you know, from time to... Christian too. <laughs> yeah, good Christian too. And so we really appreciate the growing audience and that uh, you guys keep up with commenting. Let's talk a little bit about episode 500. As a group, George, Gavin, and I said, why don't we have people submit their own videos of about 30 to 45 seconds where they say, hey, I'm from so-and-so. I watch Anklin Unscripted. Love the show. You guys do a great job. I love it for this reason. And I'm putting right here this little stopgap. This is the first video I received. Hello, Kevin, George, and Gavin. Greetings from Ayrshire in Scotland. I'm Andrew Baldock and until last year I was a rector in the Scottish Episcopal Church but left after they introduced so-called same-sex marriage. I now uh, minister to a small congregation in an independent evangelical church um, but very much consider myself still to be an Anglican evangelical and keep up to date with all things Anglican through your very great ministry, which I much appreciate and uh, encourage you to keep up the good work. Every blessing. This is what we're looking for. So if you want to do something like that and be part of episode 500, we're going to pick the best of the best, but we're also going to make 500-B where we just put them all. All you know, If we get 500 subs uh, submissions, we're going to put them all in there. Hopefully we get a good 30 or 40 that we can put into the main episode. Be a lot of fun. Uh, we appreciate the, I think I got 25 uh, submissions already. They're really good. You guys know what you're doing. Well, how do I send you a video? Well, the best way to do is to upload it uh, in your Google Docs and share it that way. Upload it to YouTube, make it a smaller file and send it to us via email. Uh, I think Gmail allows up to 20 megabytes per video file. You can do that with 30 seconds. Not a big problem at all. Today's topic, there's no there there. I know it's a strange topic, but that's what we started talking about. We got all depressed, and uh, we're going to talk about the difficulty we're seeing in the church and the hope of Christ at the end. So, Gavin, you went to Canterbury Cathedral this weekend. How was it? I was very much looking forward to it. Um, the school at Canterbury is the oldest school in, in England. It was begun in 597 and it never stopped. So it's gone through a whole series of, of, of uh, different expressions. But it's a, it's a pretentious thing, slight, a slightly pretentious thing to have gone there. And the cathedral is built in the middle of the school grounds or the school is built around the cathedral. Um, there's even the older cathedral, which burnt down before the present one was, was built. But I went back because um, I haven't. I left there in 1972, and I've haven't gone back very much. Uh, in my in my twenties and thirties, they asked me back to give some talks and to lecture a bit. But I've and I was once I was once offered the job of being a residential canon and directing the new educational centre. I think in about the year 2000. But the dean slept on it, and we woke up the next morning and sent the archdeacon of Canterbury round to withdraw the job. He 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 had a bad night and thought I might not. Well, who knows what he thought? Anyway, uh, but it meant I never got back there. So I went back to an even song where old king scholars um, who'd sung there uh, could sing, and I looked forward to meeting some people I hadn't seen since 1972, uh, and I'd spent five years of my life with earlier, and I w and also it was it was a way of 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 saying goodbye 
to me, to the, to the cathedral and what it represented. I, I often thought God might call me back to ministry there, and he never did. Uh, but I had two shocks, <laughs> and they were really quite serious ones because, first of all, as, as we were in the cathedral, um, I, I, I felt a shiver of some kind. I thought, I need to put a coat on. There's something wrong here. Maybe it's cold. Um, why is it so empty? Uh, and as I began to pay more attention, I realized that the, that the place that had been full of God's presence as I, when I'd really known it, now felt like an empty barn. It was as if the atmospheric pressure had changed, as if the, the, it had grown thinner in, in, an, in an emptying kind of way. And, and I then started looking at the, into the eyes of the people who'd been there with me, and I liked them very much. And I was, I think I was hoping to see some Christianity. I was looking, we were all singing Christian stuff. It was Eve, Anglican Evensong after all. And um, I'm sure that, that many of our listeners have had the same experience of looking to, into people's eyes to see who's there. <laughs> Is Jesus there? Is the compassion there? Is the, a depth of humanity and maturity there? There are all kinds of things that can be there. Um, there are three main categories, I think. One where the eyes are alive, the soul is well, the lights are on. Um, one where there's nobody there, it's blank, there is no there there. Uh, and one, of course, rather more alarming, where there's some kind of demonic, almost like a sort of lizardy skein over the eye. Uh, it, it, it's hard to explain, but once you know it, you know it, and you see it straight away. This was the middle category. I looked at my old colleagues, and there was no, there was nobody there. And I thought, this is a bad combination. The cathedral Ichabod, the presence of God, appears to have departed. And my colleagues, my my old contemporaries, are on are their, their their souls have have nothing's happened to them. Interestingly enough, in case you think I was being over neurotic or over pretentious, because I I wondered, <laughs> I put it on Facebook, and um and, and I just got a comment after comment after comment from people saying, yeah, we've been to Canterbury in the last five years. There's nobody there. It's empty. It's a barn. It's very sad. Well, they're the eyes that there's ahead, the visual sight, photons and all that, and then there's the eyes of faith. And Gavin, you're actually seeing through both eyes. You, The things you were experiencing, I think anybody can see, but also you had the discernment in back of that to interpret what you were seeing. That there is a lack of the the holy, the, the flames of the Holy Spirit have banked so low as to almost have gone out. I remember about 15, 20 years ago, Ephraim Radner and Rusty Reno, uh, both noted Episcopal theologians at the time, Rusty's now become a Catholic, editor of First Things magazine. They penned an article saying that the Shekinah glory had withdrawn from the Episcopal Church. And what you're describing is not, is not confined to Canterbury Cathedral. It's, con it, it's the crisis of Western civilization. That I've seen it. I'd seen it before, George. It, I mean, it, it took me, I didn't expect to see it in the cathedral. And the cathedral is so big, you don't notice there's nobody there because, it, you know, you're surrounded by these wonderful, enormous pillars and color. And, and you know, there is immediate impact on your senses. So it takes a while to say, you know, where is the Lord? But I, I remember going to a church where I'd said my prayers for seven years with clergy colleagues and then coming back 15 years later and entering it and, and feeling that, my goodness, they stripped the place of everything. What? Are, and then as I looked round, I discovered nothing had been taken away. And I realized this blank drabness was what was left when the presence of the Lord had gone. When we'd been there with some very faithful Christians, um, the presence of the Lord had been there. You felt it when you walked into church. In 15 years, blank drabness had set in. I don't know when it started in Canterbury Cathedral, but I'm certainly sure that what I, I remember experiencing the presence of God in the late 1960s when I was confirmed there and used to go to Mass to the Holy Eucharist in the, in, in the cathedral, bowels of the cathedral, on winter's mornings in, at seven o'clock. Um, I, I, I remember when, when you and I were there with Kevin, uh, all well, three of us were there for the, uh, uh, for the meeting of the primates Again, we went down to those very same bowels. He'd gone then too. There was nothing there at that stage. 
We didn't talk about it. I agree. There was a difference between when I went for uh, Lambeth 2008 and my last uh, visit in uh, 2018, 17, 16, whatever. Um, It's different now. Uh, There is no there there. And it's an interesting discussion because, well, you read the Bible and Jesus says, I'm going to put uh, Peter upon this rock. I'm going to build my church and the, the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Well, how do we find you know a place like Canterbury Cathedral empty then? If the, if the promise was that can't happen. Well, let's look for the places that are full. Uh, this is the tourist season in Florida. We're at high season and we'll get... 15, 20 out-of-towners who are vacationing in the area who come to the local Episcopal Church. And this past Sunday, um, I had a dozen people who I'd never seen before, who I'll never see again. They're down here on golfing vacations. And the thing that each of them said uh, was that, you know, we've never been in an Episcopal Church like this before. This is the first time we've been in a church, What you know, what do you put in the coffee? Uh, what what do you what do you put in the air freshener in the bathroom? And I've seen this in many different churches. I've seen this in churches uh, uh, of many many denominations, many backgrounds. But what it is, it's not. It's the if you will the the opposite of what Gavin's speaking of. Mm-hmm. It's Gavin spoke of visiting a church he had once served fifteen years later. And the glory had been departed. Ichabod had been written across the walls. And then the other is going into a place where you just have a sense of the presence of God. You may, not, you may not. You may not think. Well, that sermon might have been a little, little light, or these people may dress a little strangely. And why can't they wear coats and ties and be proper Episcopalians? Mm. No wonder the government going to get down. But the power of God is not. The, the presence of the Holy Spirit is still out there. It's part of our job as individuals to participate in such places where you, the worship is there, where God I, I is think, present. I think an extension of what we're talking about is, is the distinction between human beings who can come to life very quickly in the Spirit uh, and matter, stones, which because God is incarnate, because in Christ all things hold together, uh, and one of the things, I mean, C.S. Lewis was very good about the way in which our job was to make dogs more like humans and his job was to make humans more like Jesus. Uh, and there was this, this kind of chain of being drawn into the Godhead. But, and matter responds somehow. Uh, matter soaks up either the presence of God or the absence of God or the rebellion against God. If If you find places which are particularly sinister or where there are unquiet, spirits or something rather dreadful has happened and and there's some kind of memory in matter which holds it i think the frightening thing about canterbury cathedral is whilst it's a it's a credi- an incredible joy that the holy spirit can bring to life any group of people in any place however architecturally prepossessing or not when you find that the sponge of stones that has been soaking up praise and prayer for one and a half thousand years has somehow become exhausted what what it, it's a bit like an ecological disaster. What does it take to bring the Great Lakes back to life again, when they've reached that level of pollution? What does it what does it mean when the Great Lake of Canterbury Cathedral is so polluted there is no life in it? And how long would it take to bring it back to life? Do we have that length of time? Will God do it? In a sense, small communities, individual souls, you know, that's the dramatic work of the Holy Spirit. It can happen quite quickly. Terrifying when the infrastructural resonance of Christendom is blank. They, I, I'm going to break an unwritten rule of this show and criticize the Diocese of Central Florida. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I can't hear this. I can't hear this. <laughs> we had the presiding bishop come to our diocesan convention, and we had about 4,500 people at the service uh, where it was billed as a revival. And I uh, went and I had to leave early uh, because I felt unwell. And I spoke then to some members of my congregation. And all these people were saying, oh, how wonderful, wasn't it alive, wasn't it vibrant? And those who, of whom I have a degree of uh, trust in their spiritual acumen, we looked at each other and we both agreed it was very entertaining. I was going to say entertainment is different. Yes, yeah. Yes. The presiding bishop 
uh, is a wonderful entertainer. Uh, but the message that, that he was presenting was entertainment. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. And I think there's a perception of some people who chase after entertainment rather than finding the rather than seeking the Holy Spirit. Um, part of the problem of the Episcopal Church is we go through all these and the Church of England is going to spend how many millions on evangelism. And what they're doing is they're spending money on entertainment, yeah. not on uh, fanning the flames of the Holy Spirit. I don't consider myself a charismatic. I don't consider myself a Pentecostal, but I do believe in the veracity of spiritual gifts and I've observed them and trust them in other people who have some of these gifts. And and in my own life, I mean, I had to leave the, the, the session because I felt so, this is a terrible thing to say, I felt so, I was going, this is such a wasted opportunity. Uh, what we have here, we don't have Jesus. We have... Uh, we have a pep rally. One of the things I've observed through uh, my years dealing with major denominations like the Episcopal Church and others is what I call zombies. People who show up uh, to church and have at some point in the past had an experience with God or had a relationship, but over time through the efforts of the church or through the efforts or lack of efforts of themselves, they've lost that. But they want to rekindle it, so they keep going back to the pews and going back uh, to the, the candles that are al allowing some aroma within the church. But it's still, they're zombies. There's just no there there. I think one of the things I'd like to contrast is, that, is the, the entertainment that George has, has spoken about and um, uh, with, with what the Orthodox Church reminds us is a necessary pre precondition to the Holy Spirit, which is tears. And so um, tears are very often the gateway to renewal because one is uh, one is lamenting about the, the distance between us and God but with, with a sense of one's own fragility and mm. sinfulness. And it's as the ego weeps and, and reaches out for God in order to be saved that, that there's the possibility of the Holy Spirit coming. And George, recently in the last couple of days, you sent me a, a book by a Canadian Anglican who was lamenting about what's happened to the church in Canada over the, the gay crisis. And as I read it, I thought that, that he had put his finger particularly on one of the issues we're talking about, which holds together tears, entertainment, zombies, and the Holy Spirit, I think, which is to say that what's happened to Christianity in our time and in our culture is, is that there have become two religions. So, you know, we can be quite quite clever sometimes, quite quite over-informed, uh, uh, fond of our own theories as, as we offer them. But I thought he'd hit it on the, the nail on the head in a very simple way. And he said, this other religion, which looks like Christianity and is practiced by church leaders and by denominations, is, is missing two things in particular. It, it's, it's missing, it, it insists on, on a false kind of inclusion. Everybody has to join in. And it explains that by saying there will be no judgment. There is no hell. In order to have tears, in order to be saved, in order to have the Holy Spirit, we have to be afraid of losing God's presence. We have to be afraid of being excluded. So any kind of Christianity that doesn't warn people that their instinctive anxiety of exclusion is correct <laughs> and that it can be mended by Jesus isn't Christianity. And that what we're dealing with is something that masquerades as the faith. It uses the same liturgy, the same clothes, the same buildings, but it has removed God the Father, the judge of all mankind, all humankind, of all creation. It's removed Jesus as saviour and made him into something else. It's removed heaven and hell, demons and angels, and it's turned it into a kind of uh, religious th therapy of some kind. Well, one of the, if, if, you, if there are no tears, if there is no danger of separation from God, if there is no joy at being saved and forgiven, there is there is no Christianity and there is no Holy Spirit, and that's that's where you get the zombies. Kevin, you spoke of uh, I guess I call them religious tourists, people who know there's something there and they go on these con constant journeys to find them. I encounter them fairly frequently, and one of the things that sort of tells me right off that they're going to move on to another place 
is that they seek to find Christ uh, on their own terms. Mm -hmm. These are the things that uh, God must do before I'm ready to sign up. In other words, they have, through their personal life experiences or worldview or frame of reference, given God, these are the parameters on which you can be God. And Gavin is ex absolutely right. And Kevin, you've made this point many, many times. Repentance. Repentance is the first thing. And to start with entertainment, to start with pizzazz, uh, that's a mildly diverting evening. But it is not transformation of life. No. What we see through Christian history, uh, just to you know, step back looking at the whole of it, much of the reawakenings and much of the, the Reformation uh, started with the repentance, started with the realization of something was wrong, but was also led in prayer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, especially here in America, in America with the reawakenings, um, groups of people got together and prayed for the church and prayed that their, uh, Christ and, and God and the Holy Spirit would just release their presence, you know, upon the nation. And, they, and, and their prayers are always nationwide. They weren't just for my neighborhood, but to, just to, to, to re-release, um, you know, to re-recognize, to re-reform uh, this nation. And uh, we've seen it here in America. I know we'll see it again in England because one of the, the pleasures of being a Christian is to pray. I'm fearful, Kevin. I'm fearful because being in Florida, we have... Uh, well, there's a very famous man up in North Florida in Jacksonville named Francis McNutt, former mm-hmm. Roman Catholic priest, one of the leaders of the Catholic charismatic movement of the 70s, 80s. He became an Episcopalian. They run the Christian, he, he and his wife, Judith, won the Christian healing ministries up out of Jacksonville. And I've attended one or two of their class, their symposiums. And one of the questions I posed to Francis McNutt 15 years ago was, what happened? Why did it all die? Yeah the enthusiasm, the power, the life that you saw in 1977, 1978, Mm. 1979, if, where is it today in 2009? What's happened to this Holy Spirit? How, how has it, uh, he, (laughs) how is he? (laughs) I I think the same could have been asked of Terry Fulham, you know, boy, you had a miracle here in Darien. What happened? Uh, is is the Holy Spirit, is God removing himself from the shores of America again? Is he removing himself from Europe again? Is this a time now where we're going to have to consider like the, the Benedictine option where we have to move into smaller communities and uh, try and preserve that flame, try and preserve that spark without the secular nation trying to destroy us? Don't know. I think one of the answers to where is he now is is the presence of the Holy Spirit is is linked uh, in proportion to our tears. One of the problems with the charismatic movement, which I got involved with really very early, um, and I remember the confusion caused by the Toronto blessing and the very difficult challenge of discerning uh, how much was God and how much was, was psychological and psychic turmoil. Uh, the questions that I, I've, I've, I've never satisfactorily been able to answer. But the, the point at which tears disappeared is the point at which it moves into the tourism that that you've both been talking about um and that combined i think with the sense that many of the people who really have been praying over the last 20 or 30 years had a sense from god that what was going to come upon the church was really going to be very crushing that we were not moving into the third or the fourth wave of successful imperialistic evangelism i mean imperialist is the wrong word but i mean you know, the, the, the pressing ahead of the kingdom of heaven in, in great terms. But actually, we were going to be faced with an enemy that was really going to kick the stuffing out of the church. And what and what the Holy Spirit had been given for in the 60s and 70s was the, was the preparation for what was going to come upon Christendom. I still find that the most cogent reading of our of our cultural situation. And I I, I think, therefore, repentance remains at the very... The, the, the very the thing we have to come back to all the time and one of the things i'm most upset about in terms of uh progressive anglicanism progressive catholicism for that matter uh is people aren't being called to say sorry 
to God for demanding him on our own terms uh, and for mispresenting our virtues. <laughs> I'd like to, to, do, to dive into Anglican minutiae at this point and uh, just share, I mean, on our sister publication, Anglican Inc., I'll have uh, a, articles that will oh, only get a few hundred people reading it because it's mildly, oh, isn't this exotic? Um, far off Africa, they're doing things a little strangely, oh my. Well, there's a, something that was called the East African Revival that arose mm. in the 1930s that evangelized much of uh, uh, Uganda, Kenra, Tanz Tanganyika at that time, uh, Burund Rwanda, Burundi, the Congo, Malawi, Rwanda, yeah. uh, Mozambique, mm. all these places. And the church took off. Those churches today, Uganda is do, doing very well. Kenya is doing very well in parts, and in other parts, it's dreadful. Tanzania is doing very badly. I had two articles recently that uh, just struck me to show how f it's not just the Episcopal Church where the Spirit of the Lord is departed. I ran a story about an, a bishop in Mutare, which is in eastern Zimbabwe, who has just filed a half million dollar lawsuit against a parishioner who filed a criminal complaint about him. The parishioner complained that the bishop stole a jeep from his church and the bishop was brought to trial, acquitted, not enough evidence. And so the bishop was turned around and is seeking half a million dollars from the man who brought this lawsuit. Now there's something about Paul somewhere or another. I think I remember saying Christians don't take your disputes to the courts. Mm -hmm. We move up, we move up country to Malawi, to the Diocese of Hapashire, where the bishop, who is an Ashoda House graduate, has just deposed, has just suspended the license of 28 priests because those 28 priests have filed a complaint of corruption against him. Mm. What we have are Episcopal leaders with a small e, all across Africa, in Tanzania and Zimbabwe and South Africa in particular, <clears throat> have lost the plot that they are now part of the principalities and powers. Mm. Uh, they are no longer agents for the spread of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people. And, you know, we may, I may carp about the Episcopal Church falling short, but it's discouraging to see this in places that we Americans may say, oh, the future of the church is Africa. Well, I know Africa pretty well. And believe me, the crises of corruption and of graft and of theological heresy and the prosperity gospel and human venality that I see in the United States, I see in Africa. And if the Holy Spirit really needs to get a good broom through the Anglican world and clean out this film. The future of the church is, is, is not Africa, it's repentance. I mean, Wesley, there are stories of Wesley speaking to very, very hardened working men, cr crowds of thousands of them, and with tears breaking out as he spoke to them. Um, I remember, to his great credit, one of the bishops in Nairobi preaching in the cathedral, talking about their East African revival and saying how very much the church worldwide needed it, and saying that what prepared for the revival was a very profound repentance. Mm -hmm. uh, Lent is the moment when we're supposed in the Christian year to do our own spring cleaning uh, and to enter into that kind of repentance. I, I, uh, I, I don't know what the formula is <laughs> for, for penitence, um, but, but all of us individually and corporately are, are called to that by our Lord as we prepare for resurrection. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we're depressed, everybody. What good news do we have? Well, we are seed sowers, aren't we? And uh, despite the ground, we are called to be out there sowing the seed. Hopefully this show helps a little bit with that by providing transparency uh, about the uh, Church Universal and certainly the Anglican and the Episcopal churches. But, you know, what we do and what we hope for is that uh, in the end, we glorify God. And... Um, since day one of the show that's been our prayer every time we finish our prayer before the show starts we say and father please 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 allow us to glorify you through anglican unscripted and we've done that now for hopefully 499 episodes so kevin I, I i don't i don't what what you what you're concerned about coming across as depression uh, if 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 we've contributed that that's not very good but actually what i think we've been trying to say 
uh, is not to inculcate depression, but but to, to to share amongst each other that we need so much more of the Lord, and we we can hold hands with one another and and say our sorries together, and that by by saying this sorry, by weeping together, by longing together, we allow then the Holy Spirit to come and bring new life. So I think what what could be mistaken for depression is actually the precursor of repentance for the Easter that's that's coming in time and the Easter that will come in eternity. So it's 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 not, you know, it's a prop there's a proper creative, recreative sadness that we're inviting, I think, each other to join in. And I'm going to say something that is highly offensive uh, to some people. Uh, over the course of my ministry, I've had a number of colleagues leave the Episcopal Church and join different denominations. Some have become Catholics, Orthodox, the ACNA. And they all do this with a tremendous, tremendous burst of enthusiasm that they're finally going to be rid of this decaying hag that is holding on to them, the Episcopal Church. And they enter their new denomination. And what do they find? they find that the church that they the J have joined because they've hated something they've left is just as corrupt as the church they've entered. Those who really do feel a call to Catholic theology or do really feel a call to orthodoxy have had wonderfully emotionally, spiritually satisfying trips, for, trips forward. Those who have run away thinking the grass is greener on the other side of the fence and have only joined the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church or even the Episcopal Church because they think their own place is sick, it's never going to work. So repentance has to start with us. It's the rep <laughs> it, Repentance begins with us. Exactly mm -hmm. right, Gavin. That's right. Exactly right. Okay, gentlemen, we've put out a wonderful show. We want to remind you people, please submit your videos, about 30 seconds, 45 seconds. Uh, and we would like to include them. I'm sorry, the cat is freaking out up here. Uh, he's like two hours off. It's not even close to feeding time. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, please submit your videos if you want to share them to YouTube or Gmail, however you want to do it. We look forward to them. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. And the Jesus Prayer is a good way of deepening our repentance. Thank you for listening.